Okay, um, let me say a happy Sabbath to everyone who have joined us. Uh, we we're coming on a little late because I was watching the NCU week of prayer and I hope you enjoyed uh, watching it also. And so I want to welcome you. I, I thought about putting it off, but okay. there is so much um, let me say a happy Sabbath that I needed to share that needs to be shared and to be discussed on this beautiful lesson that we have studied this week and on the series that we are doing. Now, Abhi Sabbath um, Ricardo, Abhi Sabbath Carlene Adamson, Patrice and others of you who have joined and are alive. I invite you to take your Bible and your Sabbath School Quarterly and we're going to be studying together. Well, we're going to be reviewing together um, Daniel chapter 3. We won't go through everything, but we'll touch on the highlights. Happy Sabbath, my sister Shauna K. Pottinger. Happy Sabbath, Cynthia Reynolds. So delighted to have you. Welcome, my sis. I know you go to your bed early, but thanks for joining tonight. Now, just before we start, we're going to have a word of prayer. And so I invite you at this time to pray with me as we prepare to study. Father, let your Holy Spirit take charge of this study. Be with each person on the channel and grant that as we study together, your Holy Spirit will be with us to guide us and direct us. We pray in Jesus' name. At the end, I can take prayer requests um, for persons who are requesting prayer and one person that requests prayer today. Now we are at Daniel chapter 3, time is moving so fast, it's just like yesterday we started the series, um, the third chapter in Daniel. Now, as mentioned before, previously, the book of Daniel does not only contain prophecies, but it also contains life experiences of individuals in Babylon, including Daniel and his friends, and three kings, two from Babylon and one from the Medes and Persians. We also mention that God was very strategic in including these life experiences in Daniel because God knew as he told Daniel through his angel to shut up the book and seal it till the time of the end. Knowledge shall increase and many shall run to and fro. God knew that the people who would most benefit from those prophecies that were shut up and sealed until the time of the end will also need not only the prophecies but the experiences of Daniel in terms of the, their faith in God and how God came through for them because they who are living in the time of the end will face similar challenges as Daniel and his friends. I hope you got that. Welcome Pastor Sheldon Bryan. Um, last Sabbath, I was not at church, and Pastor Brian, I listened to his study. Uh, welcome, Yannick, and others. Now, so we are saying that the, the experiences of Daniel and his friends were very strategic in being included in this narrative, and we are to pay close attention to them because they have many lessons for us who are living in a time of the end and close to the end of time. Just before we get into this chapter, we're going to reflect on the context for those who joined us for the first time. Because if you started with me from the beginning, you would have understood the context in which we are operating. Um, the context is that God was the one who gave Judah his kingdom. The kingdom belongs to God. He is a rightful owner. But he had lent it to the Jews, to the Israelites. But due to unfaithfulness of their kings... God decided to punish them by making them subject to a heathen king and um, lend the kingdom over to Nebuchadnezzar. All right? But the kingdom really belonged to the Messiah, Jesus, who is the second Adam. And so um, that's why within the first few years of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, God gave him that vision in Daniel chapter 2 to explain to him that the kingdom 
is borrowed and it's not going to be his forever. All right? And so um, Nebuchadnezzar got that message and he praised Daniel for interpreting the dream and for sharing the message that God gave to him and to be able to interpret and to, and to save the lives of all, all those wise men. But um, by the time we get to chapter 3, it seemed that Nebuchadnezzar went to sleep and slept off that dream. He forgot totally about that dream. Well, he didn't really forget about it. He forgot about the part where it is God who gave him the kingdom. And we find Nebuchadnezzar in no mood for any rival. Nebuchadnezzar is in no mood for, for, for any rival. And so we find in Daniel chapter 3, I'm going to read a few verses here. Um, Daniel chapter 3. We're going to read from verse 1. It says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image. Right? Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three square cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Those measurements are not by mistake. Um, Babylon is the one who introduced to us the, the sexagesimal system where we count not by by. 10 or base 10 but by base 60 and so you find that we still use that system today in our, in our, in our time and we count our time by 60 or or hour by 60 and so on and um, that's the dimension in which the king made the image next verse says and king Nebuchadnezzar then Nebuchadnezzar the king set, sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, I have to go back over here. <laughs> then the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together on the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar, that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And an herald went forth to command, O people, nation, languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And whoso falleth not down and worship it, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace let's pause here to take some time to reflect on nebuchadnezzar's contention you see um we need to understand what was going on in nebuchadnezzar's mind at the time what happened is that um nebuchadnezzar was ruling the second greatest empire well he, he brought it to such greatness you could say it is the greatest but before babylon there was assyria and assyria could be considered the first world empire except the fact that they did they did not destroy um judah what happened is that before assyria became world empire that area in mesopotamia was generally ruled by city states and these city-states um, in various localities would maintain themselves through fighting wars and when they feel that they are not strong enough by themselves they would form confederacies with other nations or other city-states smaller city-states for example in genesis chapter 14 you read of the story of the five kings who fought against the four kings you know and abram fought against them both and won and brought back Lot. But within between 800 and 700 BC, Assyria um, rose to prominence by conquering a number of these city states and bringing them under their dominion. And so they, they, they spread their wing across, you know, going up to the north, 
even all the way down to Egypt, they spread their supremacy. And if you read in the Bible, you'll see that Assyria was a nation that conquered Israel um, and brought them into captivity forever. Now, um, what happened is that um, having such dominion was good, but it was very challenging because you needed the loyalty of these rulers who rule different city-states. The, the king of Assyria needed to have the loyalty of these, of these city-state governors or, or, or province leaders. And there was one city-state that was very rebellious down into the south there of Mesopotamia called the Babylon. And it, eventually, to cut a long story short, Babylon eventually, run about 626 BC, between 626 and 612 BC, um, Nabopolassar and his son Nebuchadnezzar conquered, um, challenged and defeated the Assyrian Empire. Even though Assyria thought, sought help with, from Egypt, um, Babylon formed a cult alliance with the Medes and conquered the territory and became then the world power. Then you can understand Nebuchadnezzar's concern that if he's going to remain world leader, he will, make, he will need to make sure that these city-states are loyal to him. And these governors who rule in their local areas are loyal to him. And so you can understand what was going on in, him, in his mind when God told him that another kingdom would rise after him. Nebuchadnezzar, obviously, when he went back to his bed, didn't like the idea. And when he came back, he, he thought about it. He says, which one of those provinces, which one of those areas, would be plotting against me to take over or to take back the empire. And hence, Daniel came up with a brilliant idea that he's going to make an image. And this image is no more of gold, silver, brass, iron, and so on. But this image is going to be of complete gold. And he's going to want all these leaders to come and place their allegiance to this image signifying their allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And so the Bible tells us, if you notice, um, let me see if I can bring it up on the screen. If you notice the type of people that Nebuchadnezzar called to the dedication, the Bible says he called the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces. Yes, the invitation went out to um, the public in general, but he, 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 these are key leaders whom he would have called from all over Mesopotamia. He wants the leaders to be loyal to him, and so he called them to this dedication to make sure they are loyal. And guess which province, province Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were placed in charge of? They were in charge of the province of Babylon. They were among the leadership of Babylon. And so they were invited. Persons have asked a question as to where Daniel was. Um, up till this point, there is no firm answer. But what we know is that Daniel was not at that dedication because if Daniel was there, he would not have bowed. And we, we, we have seen that in later on later experiences even with the lions then some have suggested that daniel might have been gone on um important mission and others suggested that because daniel was not um among that leadership he, he, he chose to sit in the gate but i don't think that would be the case because daniel was among based on his position he would needed to come to that dedication but we accept that he was not there whatever the case is all right. Then the Bible tells us that all sorts of music were employed 
in this worship of the image. All type of instruments were associated with the dedication of this image. You know what this tells me? This tells me that Satan doesn't only work by force to get us to do as he wants. Satan also works by seduction. He tries to seduce us into doing what we are not supposed to do. You know, um, it tells me, brothers and sisters, that every day we are bombarded by the message of the of Satan's kingdom through music, through all manner of entertainment. And if we allow ourselves to become consumed or, or with these things, then when the command goes out, when the decree goes out to bow, we are more likely candidates to bow. Alright? Now, we are going to move on now by considering the experience of the three Hebrew boys, this is the second section of our presentation, in relation to us who are living in these last days. I want you to understand that what, what um, the Hebrew boys went through, we can call them boys, we call them men, whatever you want to call them, their experience mirror the experience of those in a time at the end who will face the restriction of their freedom to worship the God of heaven whom they are loyal to. And that is found in Revelation chapter Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11. The Bible tells us about a king or a kingdom, a beast, who imposes a mark. That no one will buy or sell. The Bible says, and he calls it all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. I wanted to understand that the time is coming when the world will be divided into two classes, just like on that plain of Dura. Those who worship God and those who worship the beast and his image. It will surround the, the call to obey or disobey God's commandments. Just like on the plain of Dura, it was the first and second commandment referring to idolatry that the Hebrew boys were challenged with. And in these last days, it will be the fourth commandment that will come under attack. And so we must study the experiences of these two young, these three young men to understand the type of faith that is necessary to overcome. I'm going to read from the book, um, Patriarchs and Prophet, or Prophet and Kings, um, page 512 and 513. It says, important lessons, important are the lessons to be learned from the experience of the Hebrew youth on the plain of Dura. In this or a day, Many of God's servants, though innocent of wrongdoing, will be given over to suffer humiliation and abuse at the hands of those who, inspired by Satan, are filled with envy and religious bigotry. Especially will the wrath of man be aroused against those who hollow the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, and at last a universal decree will denounce these as deserving of death. The season of distress before God's people will call for a faith that will not falter. His children must make it manifest that he is the only object of their worship and that no consideration, not even that of life itself, can induce them to make the least concession to false worship. To the loyal heart, the commands of sinful, finite men will sink into insignificance beside the word, of the word of the eternal God. Truth will be obeyed, though the result might be imprisonment, exile, or even death. As one person says, death before dishonor. And so, 
the final phase of this study, I want to focus on the faith of these three young men. To appreciate their faith, we need to get a little insight into their experience and what it was like. I want to understand, brothers and sisters, that these young men, it is obvious that before they came to Babylon, their parents would have taught them the word of God. Their leaders would have taught them the word of God. They would have listened to the preaching of Jeremiah the prophet. And they would have come to recognize that it is because of unfaithfulness to God why Judah was led into captivity. But God always has a remnant. Amen? God, will, God always have a faithful few who will not bow the knee to Baal. And so... I found it very interesting as I read this week and took note of it that these young men would have traveled for 700 miles on foot because usually when, when Assyria or Babylon captured another nation they would either do one of, do one of two things they would either subject that nation to... to um, tribute to pay tribute and leave them in their own land or they would exile them to a different land in this case Nebuchadnezzar tried both at first he put them to tribute but eventually because of the rebellion of, Z of Zedekiah he had to exile the some of the most of these men right and so these men would have walked for 700 miles probably in chains and that would have given them time to think about the God who they believe in. It would have given them time to think about what experiences they are going to face. Just like Joseph went into Egypt. But somewhere along that journey, these young men pledged in their heart that the God of heaven is bigger than the God of Babylon. They would have made a resolve in their heart that they are going to be faithful to the teachings that their parents taught them. And hence the experience recorded in the, in the first chapter of, Dan, of, of Daniel. And then this one, where the most powerful king on earth, because we have to put it in context, we have to really understand what these men faced. The most powerful king on planet earth set up a golden image and call all to come and worship and to bow down. And if they do not bow down, they're going to be cast into the fiery furnace. These young men faced great challenge. I want you to understand that. They would have become probably overwhelmed with the awe of Babylon, the great power. Of Nebuchadnezzar, because remember, remember, this was only the second of such an empire governing such a vast area. But guess what? These men did not bow. It wasn't on the on the on the plain of Dura that they didn't bow. But as they came into Babylon and looked at the glory of it, like Joseph, they resolved. That they're going to be faithful to God. And so, brothers and sisters, these young men were not overwhelmed by the glory of Babylon because they had seen the glory of God. They were not awed by the power of the king because they were consumed and awed by the power of God. They didn't look at the fact that they were few in number because their eyes were open and they could see, brothers and sisters, thousands of angels were sent from heaven to condescend on the plain of Dura to make sure that those young men who stood for God would not perish. You know, oftentimes we tell the story as if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were outnumbered. We envision the, 
the the plane with 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 thousands of people bowing and we only see three young men but like the servant of elisha i pray that god would open your eyes that you might see that heaven came down on that plane that day because it must be known who is king nebuchadnezzar only saw one he only saw this the one walking in the fire who looked like the son of god but shadrach meshach and abednego recognize that they that are with us are more than they that are against us and so this is a faith brothers and sisters that kept shadrach meshach and abednego in that fire and that fiery experience and this is a kind of faith that will keep god's people today while the world might seem like they are they outnumber us while it is that the wicked might seem to prosper while it seems like the the unrighteous ways are getting ahead and and the most powerful men are are calling for god's head you know this week i was i i, I commented on a channel and I, and and i was i was i was defending god and i tell you when i listen to some of the comments I said, God, you must come for this world. People were being blatant and blasphemous in their comments against God. And the temptation is to think, boy, who am I to stand? But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's faith and their experience teaches us that they that are with us are more than they that are against us. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego sorry demonstrate that the god they serve is truly the rightful owner of the kingdom and it is his kingdom that we are looking forward to a time is coming when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of the lord and of his christ and they shall reign and he shall reign forever and ever i want to close this study by reading a few verses from what has become one of my favorite psalm in psalm 37 because many times it can appear that the wicked will prosper the bible says fret not thyself because of evil doers neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as a green herb it is an awesome thing, an awesome demonstration of the majesty of God that three young men, by the power and faith of God in God, could bring a great monarch to his knees to say, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come forth, because now I know that your God can deliver my brothers and sisters as we look forward to the end we know that our faith will be tested and tried and as i said before it's not on the plane of dura alone that shadrach meshach and abednego stood for god they stood for god in their personal lives they stood for god in in their among their colleagues they stood for god among their relatives and and their countrymen and among their co-workers and when the time came they stood for god on the plane of dura the question is are you standing for god in your family are you standing for him at your workplace are you standing for him in your personal life because only then can your faith be prepared to stand for him when it matters most may god help us to be prepared for that time amen thank you so much for joining here so much i could i could share but i have to keep it within a message this a study of daniel um one session is not enough but we get the message that god is trying to share with us so I invite you brother and sister to continue to study and join us next week as we 
um, though chapter 4, where Nebuchadnezzar will finally get the point <laughs> about who is in charge of the kingdoms. Amen. Thanks for joining. If there are any prayer requests, um, I might be thinking, if there anyone who has a prayer request and want me to pray for them at this time as I close, um, feel free to to um, mention it at this time as we pray to close. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the leading of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the demonstration of your power on the plain of Dura. You came through for those three young men. O oh Lord, we praise and bless your name for your goodness and your love towards us. Help us, Lord, to have that faith like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to say that even if God doesn't deliver us, we will not bow. Give us faith, we pray, and help us to be faithful in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for joining, and God bless you richly.